Good afternoon, everyone. Today is November 18th. And I just want to remind everyone that quiz six will open tomorrow. And I believe I mentioned this on Monday. I'm going to remove Sunday as the due date for it because we still have, you know, Thanksgiving and there's even a couple of classes after that. So there's no reason to make the quiz due on Sunday. So take your time and we will uh, make sure that it is due before the end of the week after Thanksgiving. And that also holds true for the discussions, okay, because I want to spend a little bit more time since we have it. We're going to talk about the Renaissance today again, and then we'll move on to the Reformation and maybe some stuff after that, after the break, okay? So just to let you know, I'm lifting the, lifting the due date on the quiz, but it will open tomorrow, and that's for everybody. All right, when we left off, we were talking about the Renaissance, and we had been talking about Renaissance artists, and I had mentioned a few of what are called the great masters. Uh, we had mentioned uh, Brunelleschi, for example, and his accomplishments, Botticelli, of course. We talked about Van Eyck. We talked about Raphael. When I was a kid, the show Sesame Street would have a little gag where they would say, uh, they would put up like an apple, an orange, a banana, and a bicycle. And they would sing a little song, you know, one of these doesn't fit in, right? One of these is not like the other, right? So if we look at all of these Renaissance people, you know, we took it, we look at uh, Giovanni Pico and uh, uh, the writers, uh, uh, Machiavelli, uh, we look at the artists, uh, Brunelleschi and Giotto, uh, and then we go to Raphael, and then we have Van Eyck, obviously, who doesn't belong? Van Eyck, right? Uh, Van Eyck was Dutch. Van Eyck was not Italian. You know, when we think of the great Renaissance thinkers and Renaissance masters, it's all Italian, but every once in a while, someone who isn't Italian gets thrown into the mix. And so, you know, automatically by this man's last name, oh, I didn't show you all here. Van Eyck is Dutch. He is not going to be, uh, he is not going to be Italian. And there was a Dutch school of art that would later emerge. And Dutch art looks different than Italian art, just to let you know. And the Dutch masters would end up developing their own, their own style. And Van Eyck is one of those that sort of created that. And there's going to be artists that come along that are even more remarkable than him. And so that's worth studying as well. And you'll study the Dutch artists when you take art appreciation. Anyway, moving on. When we think about the great masters of the Renaissance, we certainly would be remiss if we did not discuss the two that always come to mind. And who are they? Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, of course. And so let's talk about them. And that's what I'd like to discuss today. And I don't think we'll discuss anything else. And we should begin by discussing Michelangelo. It's worth noting, Michelangelo and Leonardo did live at the same time. Uh, they did know each other, and the story goes they were not friends. They did not really like each other. For whatever reason, uh, they didn't get along. You know, both men were known to be somewhat odd in terms of their personalities. Incredibly, just mind-blowingly intelligent, of course. And so some scholars, experts have speculated that maybe they had uh, some version of autism or something like that because this enormous skill that they had was matched with uh, what are described as very poor social skills. You know, they couldn't get along with people. They didn't really have friends. Uh, social gatherings were not really their cup of tea. Um, Leonardo was particularly this way. He was actually quite reclusive for much of his life and, and was known to be very difficult to get along with. And so who knows? Uh, it's, just, it's just interesting. And, and we do know, of course, that people with extreme artistic ability sometimes are a little quirky, aren't they? You know, sometimes these, these artists are, you know, socially they don't, they don't quite march to the same beat as the crowd, and that's just kind of how, how it is. Anyway, what we need to know about Michelangelo, at, you know, for, to begin, is he did not consider himself a painter. He considered himself a sculptor, and boy, was he a good one. 
During his lifetime, he was openly recognized as the greatest sculptor of the era, if not the greatest sculptor ever. This was not somebody whose talent was, was discovered after he died. Uh, this is not Van Gogh, who was a complete failure during his life and then was later recognized as great after he died. Michelangelo was recognized as brilliant during his life. He was incredibly talented. Um, this is his most famous sculpture. This is David. This took him several years to create, of course. It's very tall. It's like 17 feet tall or some, some super height like that. It's carved from one gigantic block of marble. And David is symbolic of the Renaissance itself. David really stands out. He is the ultimate Renaissance man. He embodies the ideals because he is an individual, You're one man making a way for himself in the world. His own accomplishments are what he lives by. And yes, this is the David from David and Goliath. This is the biblical David. Now, one question that obviously comes to mind is why is he nude? You know, why is he why is he walking around with it all hanging out? Well, keep in mind, during the Renaissance, they had a rediscovery of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. And we know that the ancient Greeks saw the human form as perfect. You know, the human form is the ultimate symbol of beauty and, and artistic perfection. Everything that the Greeks did when they're displaying the human form was generally nude. And in their mind, it would be kind of odd if you didn't show the human form naked. Like, for example, if you're going to go to a show and you're going to see people dance, you wouldn't put a screen up in front of them while they did the dancing, right? That would be kind of weird. Why would you go see somebody do something with their body and then not be able to actually watch what they were doing? And so to the Greeks, in their mind, if you're watching the human body be human, watch the human body be human. You know, that's what makes it so remarkable. The Olympics, for example, the ancient, Greeks Olympics, uh, ancient Greek Olympics, all the athletes competed nude. And in their mind, it would be strange if they didn't. And if you say to yourself, well, that is pretty strange. Actually, no, it's really not. Um, I want you to think of uh, WWE, professional wrestling, right? Why are the men wearing basically Speedos? What are they trying to do? What's that? Well, it makes them hard to grip, but what's really going on is they're showing off their big muscles, aren't they? Right? WWE wouldn't be nearly as much fun to watch if the men were wearing baggy clothing. Right? They, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting you to see the, you know, the pecs and, and all of that. Boxing. Male boxers do not have to have be topless. Right? But male boxers just wear the shorts and, you know, they're punching each other. And when you think about it, boxing wouldn't be as good if the men were wearing shirts. Right? You know, and it's it's... It's just how it is. And so we still want to see athletes, we still want to see their bodies, although nowadays we do cover them up to some extent. Um, also, what we want to express is, or what Michelangelo is trying to express here, is that this is David against the world. I want you to think about the story of David. You know, here we have this poor little shepherd boy who's basically a nobody, right? And then Goliath, the big, mean, ugly Philistine, is harassing he and his people. So what does David do, right? David steps up. David accomplishes something. David finds that inner bravery and challenges the big mean Goliath. And of course, we know, you know, the rock and the sling and he kills Goliath and, and David wins. And then David then elevates himself. And David was born a nobody, but he died a king. So David made it happen. He achieved something. And so that's kind of what the Renaissance is about, right? Make something of yourself. You as an individual are, are valued. And that's that kind of is, is seen in the story of David. Now, this sculpture itself was actually designed to go on the top of the dome in Florence, of the Florentine Cathedral. You know, we talked about that before. There were going to be several statues that were going to go around the top of it. And Michelangelo was kind of quirky. He loved throwing little gags in with his work. And this was going to be placed where David and his sling are staring straight at Rome. Because you see, at the time, Rome and Florence were sort of rivals to each other. 
And Rome is the big powerful state with the Vatican, right? Rome is the Goliath. Florence is the little David. And so Michelangelo wanted to kind of show that by having Florence staring at Rome with David. And you can also tell by the sculpture it was that way. Uh, if you look at David's right hand, you'll notice it's it's too big. You know, his, his right hand is out of proportion. But actually, it would be correct if you're looking at it up from the ground. You know, Michelangelo was able to figure out how it would look. So the proportions aren't quite right for that reason. But once he created the statue, the leadership in the city decided this is too beautiful to be put way up there and seen from a distance. So they kept it on the ground. And it stood outside uh, in Florence for a really long time. And I believe in the 1800s, sometime like that, they decided to get it out of the elements, and so it was moved inside. And today there's a replica outside where, where it used to be. And if you want to see it, you got to go indoors. And the idea is, of course, to protect it. And there's even some concerns because there's a subway line that now runs underneath the museum that it's in. And they're worried that the vibrations from that subway line might be stressing the statue in, in one way or another. So it's very carefully watched. But Michelangelo did other work as well. Let's go ahead and get the lights I really want to show you how just incredible this man's talent was. Go ahead and kill the lights. Uh, Moses, which is there on the right, this was created as the, for the tomb of one of the popes. And remember, this entire sculpture is, is marble. It's, it's, it's just one block of stone. And, you know, look at the hands going through the beard, right? And, you know, it's, it's flowing. It's actual movement within the marble. It's, it's so incredible. You know, look at, look at the, uh, just the detail. It's, it's, it's amazing. This little spot in the middle of the knee right here, that little spot there, is said to have been the last strike from the, from the chisel when Michelangelo created created it when he was finally done, he whapped the knee and said, okay, Moses, arise, you know, because it was so perfect. And if you look over here at uh, Pieta, this is Mary Magdalene with a Jesus that has just been crucified. I want you to just look at how the, look at how the marble just flows. You know, this is, this is incredible, just absolutely stunning. You can understand why Michelangelo could easily be considered the greatest sculptor of all time. You know, and the whole point here was to be so good that even the ancient Greek masters would respect his ability. In fact, Michelangelo was so good that it kind of came back to haunt him because the Sistine Chapel is at the Vatican and it is the private chapel of the Pope. And it's, it's a pretty big chapel, of course, but it's, it's sort of the Pope's private chapel. And it had been around for a little while. And it had been painted before, but the Pope at the time wanted to have it repainted because now we have all these great Renaissance masters and it's time to update the paintings in the, in the Sistine Chapel. And so the Pope ordered Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the chapel. Now understand, the Pope didn't like Michelangelo and Michelangelo most definitely did not like the Pope, but he was the greatest of the era, and so you're going to do it. And when the Pope tells you to do something in Renaissance Italy, you don't really have much of a choice. And Michelangelo ended up taking years to complete the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Here is the chapel itself. So you can see it's very ornately decorated, but the ceiling is the part Michelangelo did. Other artists did different parts of it. You can see the part in the back here. I believe this was done by maybe Raphael. I'm not sure. But the ceiling was done by Michelangelo, and you can sort of see it here. Uh, there's a series of cells, and each cell was painted separately. And what Michelangelo did was, was create different biblical scenes, and he tended to stick with the Old Testament. And the most famous of these cells is dead in the center, and it is the creation of Adam, right? And here you have God, you know, reaching down uh, from above and bringing life to Adam, and thus getting the whole human process going. And you can see the, you know, the tension, you know, I mean, he's just touching his finger, but not quite, you know, hey, Adam, you know, pull my finger, that sort of thing. And again, Michelangelo loved throwing in Easter eggs. He just loved doing that sort of thing. 
And one of them was discovered actually in the 1990s, 400 plus years after this was painted. And he figured this out. It was a, a, a doctor that was going through, looking up at the ceiling. And when he saw God, he immediately said, that's the cross-section of a human brain. And sure enough, now you can see it. And what they've done since then, of course, is actually take a diagram of the human brain with the, with the blood vessels going through and the major nerves going through it. And sure enough, it syncs up almost perfectly with the structures within the human brain. So that was a, a little gag that Michelangelo decided to throw in there. There are other really cool cells also on, you know, in, in that uh, collection. Here we have uh, down here the fall of man. You can look a little bit more closely. Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, before they have sinned, you know, they look very healthy, very beautiful. And then if you go to after they have been cast out of the garden, you'll notice they look old and haggardly, right? They don't, they don't look good at all. Now they're going to have to live in the real world where there is pain and unpleasantness. And if you're looking and you think, yeah, Eve is, she looks great, but she doesn't exactly look like a she. You know, Eve is, is pretty masculine looking. That is not by accident. Michelangelo used men to model both the male and female figures within the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And so the women have masculine forms to them. And why exactly he did that is still, it's, it's not known. You know, nobody, nobody really knows why he made that choice. But nevertheless, he did. Uh, the creation of the sun, moon, and planets, right, uh, is up here. This is another one that you can see. Um, and yes, in case you're wondering uh, what's what we got, another moon is obviously being created there. Uh, once again, we've got the we got the gags that he threw in. Michelangelo did not like the Pope. He was mad at him, and he didn't want to be forced to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He had other jobs he would have rather done. When you go into the chapel itself, there's a special seat just for the Pope. It's the papal throne in the Sistine Chapel. And this cell is in the direct line of sight of the papal throne. And so here we have God, you know, hey, you, right, you know, mooning the Pope. And although not proven, it seems pretty obvious the message Michelangelo was trying to send. And there's other little things in there. There's one picture of Satan that he did in one of the cells. And the picture and, and the figure of Satan looks strikingly like the Pope. You know, the Pope, I forget, I forget the name of the Pope that was in charge at the time. But I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a portrait of the Pope as the, as the devil. So all kinds of fun little stuff that Michelangelo threw in there. Michelangelo was also the architect of the modern Vatican, or more specifically, the courtyard of the modern Vatican. And the Sistine Chapel, just in case you're wondering, is right there. Uh, I'll zoom in. See that, that, I'll have to show you. It's, that's the Sistine Chapel right there. And then, of course, outside is, outside of St. Peter's Basilica is this big courtyard and those two big colonnades were designed by Michelangelo. And the idea is that that is God embracing the flock. You know, when you go there, God is giving you a big hug. And that's why they wrap around like that. And there is a uh, this obelisk. That was added much, much later. I believe that was added in the 1800s, maybe. Uh, and that's got a whole different story around it. But even today, if you want to go to the Vatican and do the tour and all of that, um, that is sort of the centerpiece and where giant crowds gather. And the Pope will give his mass and his weekly messages and, and so on and so forth. Right here, that, that is the papal apartment. That's the Pope's home. And he'll go to this little window here. Uh, you can kind of see it. It's right there. There's two little open windows. And that's where the Pope will stand to give messages to the crowds. You know, he'll stand out and popify the people and tell them what's on God's mind at any given moment. Um, so you see this on the news. And we can see the Renaissance influence. We can see the Renaissance influence. Now, there were many other architects and artists that also had an influence on this. I'm just pointing out Michelangelo's contribution. Well, let's move on to Leonardo. And I believe I mentioned before, his last name was not da Vinci. 
Da Vinci was where he was from, more specifically Leonardo of Vinci. So he's just simply Leonardo. He was, as I mentioned, far more reclusive and I guess we would say cantankerous when compared to Michelangelo. Also recognized during his lifetime as an absolute genius talent. You know, he was not uh, overlooked. Everybody understood this guy has a level of ability that just far surpasses what even a great artist would have. Leonardo really did walk to his own beat, though. He only painted, I think, maybe 12 or 13 works in his entire career, at least, that, that have ever been discovered or known. So it was only a very small handful. The most famous, of course, is the Mona Lisa. Everybody, of course, knows the Mona Lisa. It's the most famous portrait ever done. The Mona Lisa currently resides in the Louvre, which is the big Paris art museum. The, the two greatest museums in the world are the Louvre and the British Museum. And the Louvre is a former French palace. The kings used to live in it. And it is just gigantic. The Louvre is so big and so expansive. There's so much in the Louvre. You could not see everything in a week if you tried. You know, it's just so, so massive. There's multiple stores, you know, uh, floors to it. It's just Huge, and of course, everything in the Louvre is, is, is priceless. It's just the greatest collection of art by far in the world. And the number one attraction in the Louvre is the Mona Lisa. Everybody goes to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's, such a, it's, it's such a popular piece that the museum has a hard time handling the crowd. Because you know, if you go into the room, the room that the Mona Lisa in is about twice the size of this classroom, maybe even larger. And the Mona Lisa is on one wall, and you know you you get you know you you get about twenty feet of, away from it if you're lucky because the crowds are always so big. So, have any of y'all seen it? Has anyone been to the Louvre to see it? I you know often will have a student or two that has. Um, I did whenever I was a teenager. The one um, thing about the Mona Lisa that always surprises everybody is how small it is. You know, the Mona Lisa is maybe the size of this podium, maybe even a little smaller. I mean, it's just it's a small little work. It's on wood. I believe walnut, but I'm not sure. And like David, the Mona Lisa is really significant because Lisa, the subject of the painting, was just a regular person. Again, she was the wife of a well-off merchant. And of course, because they have money, they want to get their portraits done. And so she, you know, she had her portrait painted. She's not a queen, she's not a duchess, she's not anybody important like that, but she does happen to have resources, and so we're going to have nice things on our wall. That's what the Renaissance is all about. Go out and make something of yourself, enjoy your life, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Lisa's sort of quirky little smile there and, you know, rather seductive look, that's always been, you know, subject of speculation. You know, why did he paint her that way? This is probably the first portrait ever done, uh, at least uh, in, any, in any European sense, of a woman looking seductively. You know, all of the other portraits are a woman looking regally in one way or another. But Lisa, you know, he decided, to, you know, she's going she's gonna to throw you that look. And so this is the first time someone had ever done something like that. And some people think she might have actually had a, had a medical condition, like maybe she'd had a stroke or something. Um, but probably, you know, she was, you know, he decided, you know, she's going to, he's going to add a little, just a little bit of sexy to that look. Um, some people think it might be a little bit of a self-portrait too. And so you compare him to her and there's been some overlays and, you know, it kind of looks like him. I, I don't know about that. Now, what happened to Mona Lisa, I won't get into the ownership, but we do know that, that after he had painted it, uh, he didn't give it to her. He decided to keep it for himself. He liked it so much that, that it was just kept. And, it ended up being owned by Napoleon, and the French kept it, and that's why it's in the Louvre today. It was stolen in the early 20th century and missing for a couple of years. And some Italian had actually just snuck into the museum after dark and taken it off the wall, and it took him a couple of years to find it. It was in an apartment, but it's back there now. Now, the original look of the Mona Lisa is not like this. It's all faded and sepia today. Uh, if you want to know what it would have looked like when painted, this is probably the best example 
Um, this is a copy of the Mona Lisa that was probably painted at the same time by one of Leonardo's students. Uh, this particular painting was for a long time thought to be a copy made many, many years later. But more recently, more recent study and restoration has indicated that this was probably done at the same time. And you can see uh, the colors, very vibrant, right? It, it, would have, it would have been a radically different looking portrait, uh, you know, when new. But, you know, the Mona Lisa's, you know, she's been through an awful lot over the years. And so now the lacquer that covers her has turned yellow. And there isn't much of a discussion toward restoring the Mona Lisa. Uh, that would be a really, really big deal. So that's never really been discussed. And like I said, uh, Leonardo didn't paint many, many paintings. Uh, he did have students, uh, as we know. Um, this is another Leonardo that's very well known. This is the Last Supper. And here we have Jesus, and then we have all of his disciples. And this is shortly before he would go off and be crucified. This was painted at a convent. And the Mona Lisa is very small. This is very large. It's like a big old wall. And he used an oil-based paint that just didn't stick to the wall very well. And that's why it peeled off. And of course, also, we're talking about, you know, several hundred years old. So that too, it was recently restored. And you can see the restored version down below. And I probably don't need to tell you that there are critics of this restoration. And some people think that it's been ruined because of the restoration job that was done. You can decide for yourself what you think of that. But nevertheless, there we have it. Um, more recently, some other Leonardos have been discovered. Uh, there's, as a matter of fact, in the 20th century, two separate paintings by Leonardo were discovered. One, one is a confirmed Leonardo, and it's just a straightforward looking Jesus. You can look that up. And then another one, oddly enough, which has not been officially declared a Leonardo, but almost certainly was, is a profile of a woman, not unlike, you know, the one by uh, Botticelli, the portrait of a young woman that we looked at last time. Kind of similar to that portrait there. And it was auctioned off at one of the New York auction houses uh, in, in the about 15 years ago or so. And nobody knows the steps that it had been through over the centuries but it was being auctioned off as a German painting from the early 1800s, you know, an unknown anonymous German painting from, you know, and, and it sold for a few thousand dollars. It, you know, it wasn't significant except for the fact that it was, it was old, but the, but the guy that bought it looked at it and thought, yeah, there's something weird about this. This, this doesn't look German. This looks Renaissance. And he bought it and then took it to some art experts. And of course they sort of had their minds blown and they began to, can, you know, think really this is a Leonardo, you know, and, and the, you know, it was painted by somebody who was left-handed, which he was, and then they did analysis on the paint, and sure enough, it matched the paint, and the canvas was from that era, and et cetera, et cetera, and they even think they know who the woman is. I, I don't have a picture. I should show you a picture of it, but I guess I don't. In any event, it was discovered, and although it hasn't been declared a Leonardo, they think it almost certainly is, and at some point, they probably will uh, make that official. In any event, that doesn't do a lot of good if I don't have a picture of it. But anyway, Leonardo is probably best understood by looking at his sketches, by looking at all of the notes and drawings that he made. And he made quite a bit of that, made quite a few. The Vitruvian Man, for example, you've probably seen this before. He's uh, looking at the various proportions of the human body uh, and, and you know, using this to get a better understanding of how to create the human body, but in reality, he was probably just fascinated with, you know, how we're built. And these sketches of people like Michelangelo were cadavers. These were corpses. And he, what he would do is he would pay people to go rob graves, and then he would dissect their bodies secretly because the church would not allow that. But he wanted to know, you know, the blood vessels and the nerves and the muscles underneath the skin and all of that. He was just fascinated by it. Uh, the Vitruvian man has also had a discovery made. If you look down below the belt, there's kind of a bulge there. And it's believed that this guy had a, had a hernia. He had some sort of inguinal hernia. Now, whether or not that was what killed him, it likely wasn't. But in any event, this, 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 was, a, this was a body. But uh, 
we have here a, you know, a, a pregnant woman and a child in a womb, and then we have this guy here. We have this here. You know, he's, he's just fascinated by how, how it all works. And then we have this guy here. And the, again, we have tendons and muscles and, and the way the bones all come together. And it's not a stretch to say that Leonardo was really a scientist too, wasn't he? You know, he's, he's really a, a, a modern biologist. And part of this was for him to be able to paint better, but part of this was no doubt just his own curiosity. Uh, here we have the, a diagram of a human heart. And then of course we have a human skull. And then you can look at this. Uh, this is pretty fascinating. Uh, we have the different poses. You know, he's posing a body in different shapes to see how the muscles of the, you know, buccular area all sort of work whenever we're moving. Uh, this is anatomy. This is anatomy. You can see with the heart valves, you know, he figures out the valves of the heart. It's, it's, just, it's just fascinating. And this is... You. This is, uh, you know, you can see the valves here. Uh, this is generations before this will be studied anatomically by actual physicians. I had a student tell me uh, there's not much difference between a doctor and an artist uh, when you start thinking about it, and, and, and there's a, a lot to be said to that. Um, he did other sketches as well. It wasn't just the human form that he was interested in. He uh, came up with all kinds of stuff, uh, battle tanks, uh, helicopters. Uh, this is some sort of a pump mechanism that he invented. None of these were really created in his lifetime. He was just interested in sketching them out on paper. And today, a lot of them have been reproduced, of course, but, and they work, you know, they, they, they work as, as planned in one way or another. He designed a triangular pyramid type parachute and there's a, there's a sketch of that, and there had always been debate on whether or not this would actually work or not. And so somebody finally built a big old gigantic version of it and threw it out of a plane, and sure enough, it worked. It worked great. It was a very viable parachute. Here we have more sketches from him. If you look, the different images here of the, of the same man, you know, we have smiles and, you know, looks of anger, you know, look at the, the you know, opening the mouth. All of these are sketches, you know, trying to get different facial expressions. Uh, we have the horses. Um, any artist will tell you, here, here are the horses for you guys. Any artist will tell you when it comes to painting people, by far the hardest is painting hands. You know, getting human hands right is really, really hard to do. So there are several sketches by Leonardo that show he's trying to get the hands right before he went and, uh, before he went and painted them. So I'll just ask you, what was Leonardo? Was he an engineer? Was he a biologist? Was he an artist? What, what, what was he? Yeah, I mean, I don't really know, right? You know, we can say he was a painter. People think of him as a painter. But again, in all of his years, he only painted about a dozen paintings. So does that really make you a professional painter, right? I, I don't know. Now, he did teach students. So I guess there's that. But he was just sort of a jack of all trades who uh, just wanted to explore and study everything. It's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And on that note, that's it for today, right? Uh, what I want to do is um, have uh, a discussion of the Reformation when we get back on Monday. We're also going to have a movie day, and uh, we'll just take it from there. Sound good? And like I said, everybody at home, um, the quiz will not close on Sunday. Uh, it's open now, or it'll open tomorrow, but you're, you're going to have plenty of days to take it because why not? All right, everybody, take care. Have a very safe holiday, socially distant, right? Socially distant, I know that's difficult, but we all need to stay safe, and I'll see you all when we get back.